to dream again. The US population seems fairly evenly divided on the topic of transgender people. An online poll conducted in 2015 by GLAAD showed that of the 2,000 plus Americans surveyed, only 16% have known or worked with a transgender person, meaning the majority of Americans still have not interacted with any trans people whatsoever. This statistic is not surprising considering how only 0.06% of Americans identify as transgender. For this reason, most people don't seem to know much about trans people, and some people, particularly older people and conservatives, tend to be very ignorant about the topic. To them, being trans is often seen as a bizarre, fringe leftist delusion, practically unheard of and doubtlessly perverted. Supporters of the trans agenda, in their eyes, only do so in the interest of being politically correct, or because of some kind of cult mentality convincing people of absurdities. Trans people are confused at best, and a danger to themselves and others at worst. It's not surprising how little people know about the research involving trans people. Whether the topic is about the reasons why people are trans or non-binary, the success of transition, the meanings and significance of sex and gender, or the reality of transphobia. But part of the problem is that without at least having some understanding of all of these, one can easily fall for the fallacious rhetorical strategies and pseudoscience often used as justification for the continued legal battle against trans rights. In this series, I'd like to take a look at trans people from a scientific perspective to help educate people about the subjects most will be understandably unfamiliar with. With that in mind, it can be hard to know where to begin. As far as what causes a person to be trans or non-binary, there's not a lot of evidence to back any single explanation, something which makes sense and is to be expected as we'll explore later on. For now though, we're going to focus instead on the psychological explanations for trans identity, or at least one in particular, but we'll discuss some of the other older science on trans people along the way and show some of the ways this topic has evolved in the next video. Certain ideas have arisen over the last century or so to define and classify trans people and gender nonconformity. Starting with the rise of first wave feminism in the 19th century, the crime of appearing in public in a dress not belonging to his or her sex was evoked in discussions of dress reform. Common anti-feminist arguments of this time often held that feminism was attempting to drop the distinction from men and women entirely, and as such, women wearing pants-like clothing was equivalent to cross-dressing. Unsurprisingly then, for many years the claims of sexual perversion and confusion amongst trans women were not challenged but rather supported. A now quite old psychological typology meant to frame the taxonomy and ideology of trans people, focusing only on male to female transgender people, was created by Ray Blanchard and built upon the work of his colleague Kurt Freund, though its validity has been denied by many in the decades since. The Blanchard transsexual typology proposed that all male to female trans people could be divided into two groups. The homosexual transsexuals who underwent transition to attract heterosexual males, and the non-homosexual transsexuals who were purportedly said to undergo transition due to their sexual attraction to the idea of having a female body, deeming such attraction autogynephilia. As for Blanchard's initial hypothesis deeming homosexual transsexuals as extremely effeminate gay men, he did not attempt to back up this claim with his studies to nearly the same extent he did with his autogynephilia claim, so I'll be focusing mostly on the latter as a result. To start, it's important that we discuss his research in more detail. One pool of potential subjects meant to test the validity of his theory included a small number of clinical patients all presenting with a gender disorder, whom all admitted to both feeling like women and cross-dressing, 
He presented the subjects with the question, did you ever feel sexually aroused when putting on females underwear or clothing? With the other materials of the studies assessing the subjects erotic attraction to males and to females. The test resulted in a large majority of the homosexual transsexual group having not experienced said arousal and the majority of the non-homosexual group having said they did. It's important to note Blanchard group bisexual and asexuals into the homosexual category by stating, in asexual transsexualism, cross-gender fetishism, or the anomaly underlying it, so overshadows or competes with the erotic attraction to females that the individual appears to have little erotic attraction to other persons at all. His heterosexuality is, in a sense, latent. The process believed to account for the apparent existence of bisexual transsexuals is somewhat different. In these individuals, the erotic anomaly manifested in cross-gender fetishism also finds expression in the fantasy of having intercourse as a woman with a man. The effect of erotic stimulus, however, is not the male physique per se, as it is in true homosexual attraction, but rather the thought of being a female, which is symbolized by the fantasy of being penetrated by a male. Blanchard said that an alternative explanation would have to be able to account for the symptom of so-called autogynephilia being common among all three groups and not with the homosexual transsexual. Blanchard believed that due to his findings on this and a few other studies, that his research showing the relationship between the supposed autogynephilia and male transsexualism presented some clear implication of cause and effect. He believed that autogynephilia was a number of erotic target location errors, which occurred when a heterosexual male develops a paraphilic object attachment, which then develops into a desire to become the sexual object themselves. Blanchard describes the non-homosexual group as presenting cross-gender fetishism and reference their attractions as paraphilia. One of these denotes an intense sexual fixation, if not one that implies significant psychological distress, and the other often implies an atypical, if not extreme, long-lasting sexual orientation. All this based on a yes answer to questions such as, have you ever experienced sexual arousal while wearing women's clothing, which could have included any kind of history of this at all. Blanchard also levied heavy suspicion towards those that did not fit his findings. The 12.5% of heterosexual males who did not report previous instances of so-called autogynephilia were said to at least partly exist due to the unreliability in gender patient self-reports, while the 15% of homosexual transsexuals who acknowledged the history of it were said to have been misrepresenting their erotic attractions. However, Blanchard's justifications relied on previous studies which he used to equate the subject's reliability to the subject's crown marlowe social desirability scores, and on another which relied on the results of a questionable penile plethysmograph test to assert that some who did not admit to cross-gender fetishism could be lying. The percentage of the groups that did fit his findings, however, were never put through such scrutiny because it was assumed they simply wouldn't be lying, and his tendency to deny those who did not fit his narrative is one of the many reasons his critics call his theory unfalsifiable and thus non-scientific. But what about his suspicions? Penile plethysmograph tests only offer interpretable data on the body's response and as such are not viewed as very reliable. There are also a lot of methodological concerns involving this kind of test. They are possible to disrupt and the design of said tests can't comment on the nature or origin of someone's attractions or what kind of fantasies or subjects which actually are the most arousing to them, nor can it determine what sexual desires they'd act upon. These tests are generally used when dealing with sex offenders, but their accuracy is very low, though other methods available for predicting sexual reoffense are generally also very poor. Also, while social desirability scores might tell you something about a person's reliability in some vague sense, indicating a person's unreliability does not prove they are lying in some specific way, nor does it justify the further illustrations about complex aspects of their identity. And since these were clinical patients seeking sex reassignment in a period where such things were heavily guarded and most often denied, especially at Clark, it's reasonable to assume the subjects largely were going to say what their clinician wanted to hear. From the stories of people who went to Clark back in the day, this is evidently true. Very few patients at Clark were approved. These patients were made to access a locked section of the building and shared waiting rooms with sex offenders. They were subjected to the same types of sexualized testing as sex offenders, like being made to give detailed examples of sexual history and fantasies, as well as those phallometric tests, in order to receive federally funded services related to transition. Autogynephilia is something only a minuscule number of trans people believe in, usually as it pertains to other trans people they know, but the majority of trans people don't believe in it and consider it ridiculous and offensive. Most of what Blanchard wrote about was mere conjecture decades ago. 
This includes things like autogonophilia does not occur in women, that is, biological females are not sexually aroused by the simple thought of possessing breasts or vulvas. The desire of some autogonophilic males for sex reassignment surgery represents a form of bonding to the love object and is analogous to the desire of heterosexual men to marry wives and the desire of homosexual men to establish permanent relationships with male partners, as well as autogynophilia is a misdirected type of heterosexual impulse which arises in association with heterosexuality and also competes with it. Blanchard talks about these in a paper dated almost two decades after his original studies. Originally, Blanchard described his results as provisional and stated that the present findings therefore needed replication, and here he still states that their accuracy is an empirical question that can be resolved with further research. He mostly cites his cronies, Lawrence and Bailey, and when not doing that, he cites Benjamin Cartman's work from the 40s and Hirschfeld's from the 1910s. A lot of his work is grounded in really old material. He also cites the work of Kenneth Zucker, who he has co-authored papers with. For years, Zucker pushed his brands of conversion therapy onto trans kids with awful if not fatal results for his subjects. He has since been fired and his clinic has been shut down, and his methods have been outlawed in many jurisdictions. Julia Serrano's paper, The Case Against Autogynophilia, brings up a number of the points I need to touch on, being likely the most well-known response to the theory by another scientist in a peer-reviewed journal. Also, I should mention I'm going to use the term female embodiment fantasies for the phenomena autogynophilia describes, just like Serrano does, because I feel it describes it with much more accuracy and doesn't have the same connotations, but I'm still going to use autogynophilia when I'm talking about autogynophilia theory arguments a lot of the time. Serrano points out that subsequent studies similar to Blanchard's have not yielded such pronounced differences between the non-androphilic and androphilic samples, though they do exist. Serrano also mentions the tendency for female embodiment fantasies and the arousal from them to be a passing phase, diminishing and eventually disappearing through transition regardless if the individual takes steps to transition medically. Serrano references the agreement in the medical literature that paraphilias are often chronic and lifelong, and states that this vanishing of a supposed paraphilia allegedly central to trans women's identity strongly suggests that autogynophilia is not the driving force behind their transgender identity. Serrano then goes on to state how many transgender women experience an awareness of being female long before experiencing this anyway. Furthermore, she shows that what Blanchard described as autogynophilia was very broad, including arousal in response to cross-dressing, fantasies of having a female body, fantasies of being sexually appreciated as a woman by a man, and imagining oneself as a woman while engaging in sex with a partner. Serrano argues that trans people, including trans men, often have fantasies of inhabiting the right body during sex because it acts as others have deemed it, a coping mechanism of pre-transition transsexuals experiencing discordance between their gender identity and physical sex. Serrano also references Madeline Winzen and her previous criticisms of Blanchard, including that Blanchard's subtypes were not empirically derived, but rather stemmed from his initial grouping of individuals based on their sexual orientation, thus begging the question that transsexuals fall into subtypes based on their sexual orientation, that he did not include female control groups, that Blanchard relied exclusively on clinical samples that may not accurately reflect the greater non-clinical transgender population, and that his results had not been replicated. To put this in perspective, here's some context from Kelly Winters. In the 1960s, Dr. Harry Benjamin defined two types of so-called true transsexuals as distinct from transvestites and non-surgical transsexuals, based on Kinsey's scale of sexual orientation. Those attracted to men were labeled high intensity, resembling Blanchard's homosexual label. Benjamin described asexual autoerotic and some bisexual individuals as low intensity or non-surgical transsexuals. He labeled transsexual women attracted to women mostly as transvestites, and the belief that those termed transvestites were not gender dysphoric or attracted to men held until the 1980s. In the real world, however, large numbers of transsexual women who were attracted to women and applied for corrective transition surgeries refuted the theory that assumed transsexual women to be gay men. They were called such uncomplimentary names as transvestic transsexuals, aging transvestites, and non-transsexual men applying for SRS. Where researchers in other scientific disciplines might have questioned the premise in view of contrary data, psychiatric researchers slept to an incredible assumption that there must be an additional independent etiology or cause for MTF transsexualism. 
Early on, this second etiology was described as a regression of transvestism into transsexualism, inexplicably provoked by stress. Blanchard's theory of autogynophilia later emerged to fill this role, but is this science, or is this a defensive response to contradicting evidence? Blanchard's theory was never popular in its field. It made an observation, a correlation, though there were a number of problems with his methods, and it relied on far too many assumed and imposed ideas. Maybe when considered in the context of its time, it wasn't really that bad, but that's a low bar to clear. Blanchard kept it alive for a while early on, with Lawrence holding the torch over the following decades, but it only truly came to public light after the release of Michael Bailey's book, The Man Who Would Be Queen. Bailey's book was mostly speculative, sensationalist, and included bizarre sexualized descriptions of the described homosexual transsexuals, and disparaged and insulted those who were called non-homosexual transsexuals for being repulsive in appearance and defined by uncontrollable sexual impulses. He did not advance this discussion whatsoever, and if anything only did more to stigmatize the perception of trans people as a whole in the public image. He and other autogynophilia proponents only helped to cement the perception of trans people as confused, sexually motivated, and in denial. It was all just two groups, and you could always tell who belonged in which group just by looking at them. One group found it impossible to express their extremely feminine brand of gayness. Gayness being something which was more common and more understood and thus valid essentially, but so stigmatized that transition made more sense because they were thought to blend in seamlessly to society as women anyway. And the other was a complicated and particularly distinct erotic target location error, analogous to sexual exhibitionist. Essentially transvestic fetishist, or people with sexually motivated body identity integrity disorder. Or later a pair bond between a married couple, or later still like a man who fell out of sexual desire with his wife but was still in love with her. Or an aspect of sexuality that includes love, affection, attraction and admiration, and presumably it will eventually be thought of as something else. Bailey had and has a terrible penchant for saying inflammatory things and focusing on the supposed unjustified hysterics of activists to whom he cannot concede any error. Blanchard resigned in protest due to the backlash against the book, but his peers at HBIGDA described the man who would be queen as poorly sourced and highly inflammatory. The outgoing president, Eli Coleman, in 2003 said that we need to promote sound and ethical research, and we need to challenge bad science. Personally, I agree with the late magician James Randi when he said, There's no such thing as bad science. It's either science or it's not. Traeger, in response to criticisms of the book, leaves out a great deal of details which could be seen as offensive and arguing against the book being offensive in general, and doesn't seem to realize that the main thing that is so offensive about it is how poorly it argues for its point, using emotional appeals to disgust and xenophobia. Many scientists and activists responded to Drager, my favorite response likely being from Bancroft, who not only disputed that the response to the book was damaging to the field, but argued that the dialogue that was recurring would actually end up driving the field further. Many of Bailey's comments were not just offensive, but absurd. For instance, in one section he says, Men who want to be women are not naturally feminine. There is no sense in which they have women's souls. As though he were some grand arbitrator of souls. Trans people were not worthy of defining their own thoughts, as their personal descriptions could not possibly hold any water in the realm of science, and Michael Bailey was the living personification of science itself. As a result, he had totally objectified all trans bodies in the name of arrogance and lust. It wasn't his fault, though. He was simply being bluntly honest in a way they were rarely capable of. Lawrence has done many similar things, categorizing her critics as typical autogynophiles in denial, often on the basis of the way they looked or their hobbies or careers. It was an odd argument that they'd both fall back on, showing a disregard for even needing to study someone to make that assessment. All you had to do was look. Again, they emit arrogance. All cis women do not present or choose careers in a 100% stereotypically feminine way, but for trans women, it's a signifier of autogynophilia. You see. In Blanchard's original papers, people who did not experience what he wanted them to were also said to be lying, with subsequent studies instead showing a larger population of such people. 
In fact, other studies have shown that trans people largely reject and are opposed to the idea of autogynephilia. But if there's any reason for the dearth of information in this area, it's simply that they have been silenced or boxed out for being too controversial, in spite of all the problems with their position. For instance, sexual orientation has not been shown to have any effect on outcomes after hormone therapy and surgery, suggesting that these apparently distinct and complicated subtypes both lead to the same outcome at the same rate. Sexuality also doesn't have implication on the rates of non-binary people and trans men's outcomes, implying that whatever the cause of their identities is, it doesn't seem to make a difference in this extremely striking way. It seems clear that by far the most common element between trans people is always gender dysphoria, and more important importantly, trans identification. The initial grouping of subjects was done largely to suppress desires to transition and access to care in the non-surgical transsexuals, and to mold the idea of the deceiver and pervert trans stereotypes into scientific archetypes. This sexualization of trans women is often an intentional tactic used to attempt to sway public opinion from trans acceptance by claiming trans women are fetishists and manipulators. One more bit from Winters before I move on. A cornerstone of scientific methodology is the falsifiability of hypothesis. The possibility that a hypothesis might be refuted by evidence or experiment. Theories are widely considered to be scientific only if they are falsifiable. By capriciously spawning a new independent theory of autogynephilia to explain the existence of trans women who are not exclusively attracted to men, these researchers rendered the original hypothesis of homosexual male transsexualism to be unfalsifiable. In my view, this does not suggest equifinality. Rather, it is evidence of a dubious hypothesis that conveniently metastasizes in the face of contradicting data. It is evidence that the development of gender identity in all people, trans and cisgender alike, is not yet understood. Lawrence in 2017 responded to many of the points brought up against her in one of the most confounding and intelligence insulting papers I've ever read on the topic, but it will give me a chance to reference the work she talks about through her and expose just how poor her arguments are. Lawrence responds to the fact that autogynephilia diminishes over time and the number of people who don't center it in their identities and tries to explain why trans people who are not paraphilic in any discernible way, let alone in a way which interferes with their other sexual attractions, are actually just mistaken in their definition. Of the elements that comprise sexual orientations, erotic desire is often the most evanescent in any particular relationship. Attraction and attachment can persist long after erotic arousal has diminished. For autogynephilic MTF transsexuals, this implies the potential to feel continuing attraction to and comfort from autogynephilic fantasies and enactments that may have lost much of their initial erotic charge. Blanchard observed in later years, however, autogynephilic sexual arousal may diminish or disappear while the transsexual wish remains or grows even stronger. It is therefore feasible that the continuing desire to have a female body after the disappearance of sexual response to that thought has some analog in the permanent love bond that may remain between two people after their initial strong sexual attraction has largely disappeared. Among non-androphilic MTF transsexuals who report that they have ceased to experience sexual arousal from autogynephilic fantasies or behavior, it is plausible that loving the idea of being a woman, finding this comforting, and wanting to enact a woman's role permanently may continue to be important ongoing manifestations of autogynephilic orientation. Autogynephilia is indeed a sexual phenomenon, but it is not merely a lusty one. It encompasses other elements of sexual orientation, including attraction, admiration, and attachment. Moreover, autogynephilia and MTF transsexuals eventually gives rise to cross-gender identities and gender dysphoria, and these, not lust, provide the proximate motivation for pursuit of sexual reassignment in most cases. Following her logic, she could be right, but it's so vague as to be totally useless. And how is it testable? Here are a number of questions to that effect. Why would a permanent love bond, and I mean permanent, be made after even just one instance over arousal from female embodiment fantasies. How can we distinguish the desire or attachment or whatever, which is being defined here as autogynephilia, from the desire for self-actualization more generally? How does loving the idea of being a woman and finding that comforting become a target localization error? How is it paraphilia? How is this only applicable to one subtype and not the other? 
How can an idea be love bonded with and become one's sexuality? A sexuality which causes one to change all aspects of their lives greatly in a very unique way to any other sexuality. It makes no sense. An even better question than how can a person be shown to have formed a permanent love bond with their idealized self-image would be how can a person be shown to not have? Can a starving amateur artist not be shown to have formed a permanent love bond with the image of themselves as a professional artist? Can we not say they are attracted to, admire, or have an attachment to the idea of being a professional artist? The questions here are essentially endless because of the multitude of ways autogynophilia is being described using terms which themselves are able to be interpreted in a multitude of ways. It makes the claim unfalsifiable and thus non-scientific. Even if we accept autogynophilia as a thing, how can we ascertain the significance of and differentiate from the gender identity, gender dysphoria, and non-lusty autogynophilia elements in determining what a trans woman is the way she is? And how is this explanation at all the most feasible when it not only makes a grand absolute truth statement that pertains to thousands of different people by creating a sexual orientation with most people that not exist, but it also admits that this is an additional agent of control alongside gender identity and dysphoria, thus avoiding Occam's razor so it can posit something that only raises more questions. What is the point? What about trans women would not make sense without its presence? A lot of things happened since the original proposal of autogynophilia theory, so it's unsurprising it needs to adjust to remain unfalsifiable. It's not atypical for scientific ideas to update themselves, sure, but it seems a great deal of narrative and semantic choices could lead someone to interpret a person's identity in this way, especially if they were hoping to. Would that interpretation then be used to somehow define them, even if they say otherwise? Moser and Veal administered modified versions of Blanchard's core autogynophilia and autogynophilic interpersonal fantasy scales, and found that a great deal of cis women based on this data could be considered autogynophilic. But Lawrence rejects this on the grounds that the findings did not adequately distinguish between being aroused by wearing sexy clothing, or by imagining that a potential romantic partner finds one attractive, which natal women apparently do experience, and being aroused simply by the idea that one is wearing women's clothing or has a woman's body. The original questionnaires are actually one of the most glaring issues with this entire thing. A single instance of autosexual arousal, which incorporated fantasizing about their female body, including one or more parts of said body, would automatically be enough to put a trans woman in the autogynophilia range in the aforementioned interpersonal fantasy scale, thereby assuming a whole lot about their identity with almost no information. Anyone can experience autosexual arousal, and to be autogynophilic all you have to do is experience this one time in a certain context that the original questionnaires assumed. Autogynophilia here conveniently avoids further questions about the significance of its alleged indicators by removing cis women as a valid control group. It's nothing but an attempt to impede investigation. Lawrence responds to the criticisms that autogynophilia, as she sees it, is often a temporary coping mechanism by saying that autogynophilia is sometimes ego dystonic in her patients. She also states that cross dressing and cross gender behavior are associated with sexual arousal in both sexual and non sexual contexts for many MTF transsexuals, both before and after sex reassignment, arguably because autogynophilia is their genuine persistent sexual orientation. First of all, arguably is doing a lot of work here, given that the argument is totally circular, but besides that, the fact that some trans women don't like experiencing this type of fantasy doesn't negate the idea it's a coping mechanism. Coping mechanisms don't have to be positive, and female embodiment fantasies could be a mostly temporary but sometimes also later engaged with coping mechanism related to gender dysphoria. Autogynophilia is not a better explanation. In fact, if we were to take her method of argumentation, any number of possible explanations are on equal ground, if not above hers, as long as they explain this arousal in some way. And coping mechanism seems to resonate much more with trans women in general, which is important. Because again, she can show that arousal from female embodiment fantasies happen, and technically she could call us such instances autogynophilia, but there's no good reason to do so. For instance, the presence of occasional arousal or romantic feelings for the same sex wouldn't make a man gay necessarily, and after marrying and only having sex with women, as well as mostly only fantasizing about women for his entire life, while rarely, if ever, still having same-sex feelings, would claiming that homosexuality is his genuine, persistent sexual orientation be a fair assessment? Sure, he could be in denial, I can't honestly say that's not possible, but is it likely? 
That's exactly the kind of thing autogonophilia theory proponents are claiming. It's actually more absurd, since unlike homosexuality, autogonophilia is not clearly defined, often denied, and a creation entirely designed by the same people making this assessment. It only seems less absurd because it is being applied to trans people and plays into people's internalized perceptions. The only real reason to evoke autogonophilia is to presume that one's female embodiment fantasies and admiring yourself or whatever else are not only a kind of sexuality, but one that must supersede other far more salient and clearly expressed sexualities. She can't refute this either, except to say a truly massive amount of people are lying, or in denial, or are mistaken about their own identities, and that's why she always returns to those points. All she can do is attempt to make the overall claim impossible to refute by making its definition as vague as possible. Is this how people's true and persistent sexualities are ever decided in literally any other case? By a small group of clinicians that they don't know and who don't know them? The homosexual, transsexual, and non-homosexual transsexual groups were born out of old perceptions of low and high intensity transsexuals. Nowadays it seems most young trans people don't see themselves in these old models, and instead we see a lot more variation and overlap, with no simple dichotomy having any significant explanatory power. None of the trans people I've ever met or interacted with online have identified with autogonophilia at all, if they even know what it is. Rarely you might see a person identifying as a true or classical transsexual, but even that is exceedingly rare. Because trans people now are less likely to feel restricted in these ways. Trans people are not gatekept from care based on orientation or physical appearance, well, at least not as much, and thus feel less pressured to identify in restrictive ways. Nowadays, there's less pressure to be invisible for the sake of safety, social acceptance, or to receive medical treatments. Those trans people still clinging to old perceptions seem to most often be right-leaning trans people, older trans people, and white trans people, and many who hold these old views do so because they think they are more socially acceptable or politically expedient. Often, they do not believe themselves to truly be women, at least not in the same way a cis woman is a woman, but the majority of trans people now generally just say trans women are women. Lawrence continuously relies on the fact that trans people are generally unreliable in self-reporting, but if not through self-reports, how has any of this research been done at all ever? She mentions how Cohen, Ketesis, and Faflin argued that misrepresentation of sexual orientation by transsexuals was so prevalent that typologies based on sexual orientation had become unreliable, but uses this as suggestive somehow that all trans people are lying if they don't conform to her pet theory. If anything, I read this and hear a further argument against sexual orientation classifications. Why is she so proud of the fact that the majority of other trans women are made uncomfortable by her ideas? Isn't that a bit odd? In one particularly foolish bit, she quotes Vielen talking about the ethical obligations that researchers have when conducting research on marginalized and vulnerable groups. That being to ensure that their findings are not misrepresented or misused in a way that can cause harm to the group being researched. She says that this somehow requires research to be able to read minds, but it obviously doesn't. None of this removes the fact that autogonophilia has and does alienate trans people and cause real harm to them. I agree with her that periophilia should not be considered bad or wrong just for being atypical, but saying this is nothing but a deflection. The ways people have used autogonophilia in denying care and subjugating trans people and denying their authenticity and sexual and gender identity is obvious. But perhaps more importantly, she and her cohorts have no leg to stand on if they're trying to argue against mind reading, because mind reading is exactly what they do and are proposing others do as well. Autogonophilia theory clearly negatively impacts trans women's lives. Apart from all the reasons I've covered earlier, there's also the very important case of O'Donovan versus Commissioner. In this case, the IRS attempted to deny deductions and surgery costs to a trans woman, but it seems they could convince no one that her desires were sexually motivated, delusional, or self-destructive. The IRS leaned heavily on the work of McHugh, whose opinions I don't talk about in this video because he's nothing more than a hate monger and has never made a single coherent argument. He is unsurprisingly a fan of autogonophilia theory. In the end, it was found that the tax law debate was merely a mask for the politics of disgust. The so-called gender-critical crowd will also cite autogonophilia theory, and lawmakers will try to use it or terms with similar connotations to delegitimize trans people and their access to care and basic human rights. 
including keeping trans women out of female bathrooms or prisons due to the pervert stereotype, or how the trans panic defense is still a defense used to absolve cis men of murder because of the connotations behind the deceiver stereotype. Again, autogynophilia theory isn't responsible for creating these stereotypes, but it sure as hell loves to legitimize them. In fact, it exist exactly to do that. Remember, these stereotypes also affect trans minors, and autogynophilia theory claims that even their identities are based on sexual impulse. The most insulting part of Lawrence's 2017 paper comes at the end, though. Like Darwin's theory of evolution and similar disputed ideas, the theory of autogynophilia continues to be useful to researchers and clinicians despite its failure to achieve universal acceptance. This is just an idiotic thing to say not only for characterizing her theory is way more popular than it is. I shouldn't have to say that evolution is one of the most well-established theories in science. Darwin's theory of evolution by means of natural selection, even when it was new, was based on League's more direct observations and corroborating evidence than autogynophilia has managed to be in its decades of existence. And evolution only ever became more popular and more well-supported through the years, with its critics becoming only more and more evidently and demonstrably wrong. Sure, the two are hardly comparable, but she started it. Her claim that the descriptive and clinical value of Blanchard's theory remains undiminished is, is purely false. As I said, it was never popular, and it generally serves no clinical purpose. If there's anything I agree with in Drager's aforementioned paper, it's that people do not have the scientific skills they should. Is the fact that autogynophilia has been overwhelmingly contradicted by trans people and other people in the field not diminishing? Further studies did not reproduce the strength of their correlations, and the evidence for causation was always weak if non-existent. But is that not diminishing? Nider in 2015 wrote, while the concept of autogynophilia might provide some clinical insight for understanding the transition-related life experiences of a minority of trans people, there is no need to assert it as universal or to hierarchize between different experiences. In the author's view, there are a very great many reasons or motives for transition which are mostly to do with the search for an authentic expression of self. However, no one's motive should be seen as lesser than the other, and respect for the individual's own narrative should be considered to be paramount. Nider and others argue that sexual orientation may be helpful in forming care, though they also agree it should not drive it, and disagree with Lawrence in stating typologies based on sexual orientation are superior in their ability to predict treatment-related outcomes, as it's simply contradicted by the evidence. Nider also acknowledges that, for a long time, professionals who endorse surgery set up a gatekeeping system based on sexual orientation in order to regulate the number of requests for transition-related care. For cross-sex treatment, only those applicants living according to heteronormative conventions of gender and sexuality were approved. That meant that I clearly binary identity and an exclusively heterosexual orientation were mandatory. Over the last decade or so, I've read many peer-reviewed scientific papers from various journals, and Nider's paper is one of the most outwardly favor of the theory that was written in that time frame, aside from maybe some papers in the archives of sexual behavior, but that's a whole other long segment to get into where we'd have to talk about Zucker and conversion therapy more generally, and I just don't have the energy to do that right now. Just know his methods are regularly referred to as child abuse. Saying autogynophilia might provide some insight in a minority of trans people, but that it should not be imposed on everyone is the closest autogynophilia concepts ever come to endorsement outside of Blanchard, Bailey, and Lawrence's bubble these days. An often overlooked fact is that the homosexual group never got the attention of the non-homosexual group, which is interesting. Almost no one even talked about it then or now, but the idea of autogynophilia and the non-homosexual group did get talked about. The other group was just as important to the structure of the theory, but it generally didn't repulse people as much, and so it wasn't as important in creating the impression they were going for. Remember the bisexuals and asexuals and the complicated explanation given to their identities? That wasn't something they ever attempted to substantiate beyond pure conjecture after those original tests, yet Blanchard still argued for years that there are only two types of transsexual. Autogynophilia theory proponents are like typical pseudoscientists. In any case, they are far more Lamarck than Darwin. They are also avid users of straw man arguments, often claiming the theory they are competing with is the female essence narrative. Yes, I know the narrative of trans women simply having a woman's essence is something a lot of people have used, but it's just a way of explaining something you don't really have a convenient way to explain to others. It's not meant to be a theory about the etiology of transgender people. 
Most people accept that the reasons people are trans are not well enough understood to exactly pinpoint, but that they do relate to sex and gender. Lawrence brings up her ego dystonic patients in her 2017 paper because the only people willing to apply autogynophilia labels to themselves and broadly deny their own authenticity and the authenticity of other trans women are generally pretty self-loathing. Autogynophilia theory proponents' goal is to ultimately establish that trans women are necessarily different from cis women in some shocking if not repulsive way. This seems to be the way a lot of people think, even if they don't argue it to the extent Blanchard does. Trans women in his view had to adhere strictly to a guideline of behavior and physical appearance because if you weren't or weren't interested in being what he saw as an effeminate gay man interested in seducing heterosexual men, you must be a sexual exhibitionist who got a thrill off of other people's reactions to your condition. That's just what you had to be if you dared to show your face not being totally cis-passing and heteronormative. Central to both these ideas is the ever-present and assume conclusion that being trans is necessarily undesirable and false and that trans people know it is. Andrea James points out how Blanchard created a system of mutual distrust between patient and clinician and how by selecting those patients and rejecting the rest, Blanchard has been able to convince his claims that transsexualism is about sex rather than gender identity. Blanchard is going to go down in history as the George Rikers of gender variants. Rikers was one of the most vocal critics of the American Psychology Association's depathologization of homosexuality in 1973. And like Blanchard's 2003 resignation from HBIGDA, Rikers resigned in protest when professional groups started to move away from his point of view. With luck, this will mark the beginning of the end for his school of thought, in the same way Rikers' resignation from the APA in 1973 marked the depathologization of homosexuality. In 2004, Southern Poverty Law Center featured Bailey and Blanchard's ties to neo eugenicist and right-wing journalist. This does not seem to be talked about these days when discussing this topic and also doesn't appear on their Wikipedia pages. Before we end this video, let's talk about the DSM. The DSM-5 divides gender dysphoria into two categories, late onset and early onset. These categories are said to frame the neurological data of trans people much better than do sexual orientation categories, but they mostly exist as a guide for professionals working with trans people to be able to recognize gender dysphoria, as it is expressed differently in adolescents and adults. This is a meaningful and reasonable distinction for this reason, but it also is far from perfect. The majority of late onset trans women are mostly gynophilic, while the majority of early onset are androphilic. However, the analogous pattern is shared in trans men, and no one, not even Blanchard, is proposing the idea of autoandrophilia theory. Though it's certainly true trans men can experience autosexual thoughts and embodiment fantasies just as anyone else can, and that sex, gender, and sexuality are all connected. The most common element in all trans people is trans identification and gender dysphoria. The DSM-5 considers gender dysphoria as a condition that broadly defines lack of congruence between physical, sex, and gender identity. Autogynophilia emerged in the DSM-5 as a factor in a disorder of sexual development. That is, as one of the ways transvestism is displayed with the other being through fetishism. Like disorders of sexual development can be, it is often accompanied by gender atypical behavior starting in early childhood. However, these people often experience uncertainty about gender rather than a strong conviction that gender does not line up. The term autogynophilia has no reason to be evoked here as it does not carry any of the further implications surrounding that term and autogynophilia theory with it. It's an aspect of an already pretty silly paraphilia, though it's unsurprising that it ties itself to old terms like transvestite. It's at least settled down to one other supposed erotic target location error instead of whatever flavor of the week bad proponents decide it is, and does not attempt to rope in trans people. It's here because of the sway Blanchard has on the committee, but thankfully it is greatly diminished. Autogynophilia sexualizes all impulses of transgender women and girls in all expressions, which leads to their devalued status as people. And this is arguably the goal as proponents of the idea revel in its lack of acceptance by trans people and vehemently reject the idea that a trans person could really know who they were. We're going to get into that next time. There's still a lot I have to say. I didn't want to start this series with Blanchard and his ilk specifically, but I knew I couldn't avoid talking about this. Not because I needed to talk about autogynophilia specifically, but because I did need to talk about the cultural attitude which produced it. This topic is depressing. 
it asks trans people to think of their sexualities and gender identities as inherently false and sexualizes non-sexual aspects of themselves, thus attempting to devalue and essentialize them. The assumption of trans women as false, as perverted, and confused is baked into our society, and it's this attitude which leads to violence and hatred. It's this attitude which makes many choose to live without the hope and joy of being themselves, in order to keep themselves safe from abuse and fear. It may play heavily into someone's gender dysphoria. It may make you wonder if you are false or ugly or lesser or in denial, even if you know that's not true deep down. You know yourself better than they do. We cannot see souls, and the world scarcely needs someone like Michael Bailey to be their interpreter. But we can see you. We can know you.